um, some formulas from yesterday. So if you remember, this was the the energy we are looking at, and uh, it was pointed out to me by uh, Gauthier last night. I, I, I used um, the same letter for two different things yesterday, which was very bad. And so I'm going to fix this by uh, defining the energy with a curly H here. Okay, and we have a, a splitting of this that we proved yesterday of this form. <laughs> Mu V is the equilibrium measure. Zeta is this sort of effective confining potential. And then yesterday, I introduced the potential uh, generated by the fluctuation measure. And so this one should be a H with straight, um, straight H. So it's the integral of G of X minus Y. It depends on X, and of course, it depends on the configuration. Uh, so for each configuration, you have a given, a given um, function. Okay, so this is the this is the potential, and if you remember, it's source minus Laplace H n equals sum of Dirac minus n mu v. And the the point was to try to prove that this uh, this next order energy can be expressed with this electric potential. Um, let me um, stop here for, um, to, to talk about what's happening in the one-dimensional logarithmic situation, because you remember that in 1D the logarithm is not the Coulomb kernel, so I cannot write this. However, it's easy to generalize these uh, formulas by thinking that uh, the real line R can be embedded in uh, the plane, so usually people do it in the complex plane, but let's embed it in R2. And so each point xi, you can view it as xi comma zero. And then this function hn, you can view it as defined over R2. So now x is in R2. It's going to be integral of minus log x minus y, the sum of the Dirac masses at these uh, x i zero minus n, and mu v is a function of the real line only. So let's write it x, sorry, y one for the force coordinate. Um, and here dy, right? But of course, mu v of y one, I can also think of this as a measure in the plane with density mu v of y1 times delta r of y. So I write here delta r to denote the sort of Dirac on the real line, right? It's the, it's the uniform measure on the real line. And it takes you, um, when you integrate a function, against delta r, sorry, let's say x1, x2. It just integrates um, with zero for the second coordinate. Okay, so once you view hn as, an, as a function on r2 this way, it's simply, um, the potential generated by the configuration, the distribution of charges at xi zero minus n mu v times the Dirac mass on the real line. And then you can write that this holds true in R2. Okay, so this is a sort of trick that allows to see um, the logarithm interaction in 1D as a sort of restriction of a 2D interaction uh, for measures supported on the real line. And then you can continue the calculations in the same way 
as if you were in R2. Um, for specialists, um, when you do, um, when you look at log gases or random matrices and the real line, you compute the still TS transform. It's it's exactly the same procedure. So you view things in the upper uh, complex plane. Uh, it's the same thing as expanding this and computing the gradient of H. So it's essentially the same as the still TS transform. Okay, so now I want to um, give a rigorous meaning to the computations I was doing yesterday about uh, computing Fn mu v of Xn and relating it to integral of gradient Hn squared. And so in order to do that, I'm going to have to introduce a truncation procedure for these uh, potentials, Hn, which are singular at each charge, right? So Hn, you remember, blows up like the Coulomb kernel near every point of the configuration. So I define, uh, I'm given, give myself some eta, which is just a vector of numbers eta1, eta n, and think of them as small numbers. And I define hn, comma, eta to be hn. So it's the same as the function hn minus the sum of g of x minus xi minus g of eta i. Um, positive part. Okay. So you see, if you remember, Hn near x, near each xi is going to blow up exactly like g of x minus xi. So this thing is removing the singular part and replacing it by g of eta i, which is a, a constant. Right, so effectively, it's the same as saying you have, a, you have a function whose graph is going to look like this, and you replace this graph by the truncated version, where you truncate at the value g of eta i. So eta i is this little radius, and you're just going to chop off all the peaks near all the points. You chop them off at distance eta i. Okay, so this is this is a formula that does this. All right, and now you can try to compute the Laplacian of this guy. So what are you going to find? Well, it's going to be the same as the Laplacian of Hn, except in the ball centered of a, at xi and radius eta. And there, instead of having a Dirac mass at xi, you're replacing it by the Laplacian of the function whose graph is like this. So let's say this is the function f eta of x. It's just g of x minus g of eta, positive part. OK, so what, this, what does this function do? It's zero outside of a ball of radius eta. It has this infinite peak. And then it stops here uh, when you reach g of eta. OK, what is the Laplacian of this guy? It's the Dirac at the origin. There's the CD everywhere. So it's the Dirac at the origin minus what I will call Dirac zero eta, where Dirac zero eta, or Dirac p eta, is a measure of mass one on the sphere of radius eta, normalized to have total mass one. 
Okay, so why is this true? Um, it's a computation, but the other way to see it is uh, this thing is radial, so the Laplacian of f eta has to be something radial. And so it's natural then that it would be a uniform measure. Well, because uh, this Laplacian is just simply the jump of the normal derivatives when you reach the boundary of the ball. Right? So it's supported on the boundary of the ball. And then by symmetry, it has to be uniform. And the fact that it's total mass 1, it's easy to check because the total mass here has to integrate to 0. All right, so another way of saying all this is that this truncation procedure, what it does, it, it removes the Dirac mass and replace it by, replaces it by a smeared Dirac mass, which is just smeared on the sphere of radius eta. All right, so when I go to compute the Laplacian here, every time I had a Dirac mass, I replace it by a Dirac mass smears, smeared at radius eta i. And then nothing changes. The rest is the same. Okay. So it's one way of regularizing these uh, potentials that are singular. And what, what's convenient with this way is that it's completely explicit and it's, it's fairly straightforward. It's just these truncations. OK, so with that, I can proceed to computing. And what I'm going to prove is the following proposition, that Fn mu v, so for, let's say for any new mu, this next order energy, which if you remember was defined by, uh, I'm going to write it here, Fn of xn respect to mu is equal to the double integral on the complement of the diagonal of this fluctuation against itself. OK, so the, the proposition is that this is always greater than 1 over CD, the integral of gradient h n eta squared minus uh, the sum of g of eta i plus error terms which are small essentially so I will control these error terms by the sum of eta i squared let me check C times N times this. So the idea is that later I will choose these eta i properly, these eta i's properly, uh, in such a way to make these error terms small enough. Okay, and there is this inequality with equality, that's important, if all the balls bxi eta i are disjoint. So it will be sometimes useful to choose the eta i so that the balls are disjoint. OK, so this formula is doing what I was uh, promising. It's, it's making rigorous this, this relation by saying, well, instead of uh, having this integral that's divergent, we're going to compute the integral of the truncated, the quantity for the truncated potentials. 
This one now is finite and convergent, but we have to remove a certain divergent quantity, which is exactly the, the energy that the tip carries. So you, if you look at what happens when eta goes to zero, this thing <laughs> tends to infinity again, but this thing subtracts off exactly the divergent behavior, and in effect you are computing things in finite parts. Right. Okay, so let me um, explain roughly how this can be proved. So the first step the first step consists in studying these the energy of this truncated potential and showing that this is roughly um, it's actually equal uh, to CD, the double integral of G of X minus Y. So this, the, inter the Coulomb interaction of the smeared Dirac's with themselves. Okay, so this, this is what? This is the computation I was doing yesterday, except now for the truncated guys, it's, it's legal. You don't have to worry about the diagonal anymore. The integral is convergent. So basically, you look at this formula. You multiply the formula by, you integrate it against the same uh, right-hand side, and then you integrate by parts, and you find this. Okay, so this is the, the legal version of it. Okay, and now what we have to do is we have to compare this and this. Okay? So these two quantities sort of look the same, except I have the, the Dirac's here and I have the truncated Dirac's there. And here, of course, I can remove the diagonal by writing that I have diagonal terms first. So what is the diagonal? Um, I'm integrated G of X minus Y, the Dirac on smeared on the ball of radius eta. This can be computed. It's going to give you just G of eta I for each, um, for each point. So this is the diagonal term. And so I'm writing that this is roughly equal to this, plus CD, the double integral on the complement now of the diagonal. And I do the same. I have the smeared Dirac's and the smeared Dirac's here. OK, and so now when I, make, when I subtract this minus that, I have this term which is not formally very much equivalent to this term. Yeah? When i equals j here, yeah. Right, so when x equals y, or when i it corresponds to y equals j. So it's the interaction of the point with itself. So if it was a, a true Dirac, the interaction of the Dirac with itself, it's infinite. You don't want to see that. But it, when it's a smeared Dirac, it's okay. It, it's a finite quantity. You can compute it, and it gives you this. Right? So this is the integral of g of x minus y delta xi eta i of x delta xi eta i of y. Right? So this is an explicit computation. It's all radial. It's easy to compute. In fact. So it's the self-interaction of a, of a smear charge, and it blows up, of course, when eta goes to zero. You should expect that it behaves like this. All right, so now my, my task is to prove that this quantity is bigger than this quantity, up to error terms, uh, and that there is equality if the balls are disjoint. And so that... Um, 
It's based on the following argument. So I'm just going to look at the terms that correspond to the interaction of the charges. So these, these types of terms, xi, eta i, xj, eta j, and now i is different from j, because I've taken into account the terms for, for which i is equal to i. Okay. So now let's look at a function like this. G of x minus y delta xi of y. For example, this is the potential generated by a Dirac at xi. We know what it's, it looks like. It's just G of xi minus x. But if you think of it as, you can view it as the solution to minus Laplace h equals uh, CD delta XI. So it's a function which is harmonic away from XI, and otherwise it's always super harmonic. So H is super harmonic. So here we use the Coulomb nature of the interaction. We're, this is really where it comes to play a role. And if I do the same with eta I, the same is true. So it's super harmonic, and it's harmonic away from bxi eta i. OK, not too hard. Now you know something that's called the maximum principle. right? The maximum principle tells you that if you take a harmonic function, and if you average it over a sphere, it's the same as taking the value at the center of the sphere. Right? The average is equal to the value at the center. So if I take this function, if it's harmonic, and now I average it on some other sphere, so I take this whole thing, and I average it, it's the same as if I take the same thing against the Dirac mass. Right? It's, this is the maximum principle. The, the average is equal to the value at the point. But that's going to be true only if I'm in the zone where the function is harmonic. So this is OK if I'm away from B x i eta i. So if B xj eta j does not see b x i eta i, then this is true, because I'm in the region where it's completely harmonic. And so I can replace the function, the average, by the value. OK, but the maximum principle also holds for super harmonic functions with an inequality. It tells you that if you have a super harmonic function, and if you take averages, over a sphere, the answer is going to be smaller than the value at the point. So in any case, I always have an inequality, which is true. OK? And so when I put all that together, I find that the integral of g of x minus y delta xi eta, delta xj eta. That's less than the integral. Um, sorry, so this is eta i, eta j, eta i. So here I can replace by the value at the center. And then I can um, exchange the roles of i and j. And I can do the same again. OK, so you find that basically this is telling you that the interaction energy between two smeared charges is smaller than the original interaction energies that you had before smearing. 
Okay, so this is a, an effect of a, the Coulomb nature of the interaction. Moreover, all the inequalities here are equalities if the balls are disjoint. And so, if I put all that together, it proves my proposition. So there is just some error terms that come from dealing with the mu v here. What I see when I have mu v and I, I, I change delta x i by the smeared uh, by the smear charge, but since mu v is a nice uh, measure with the density, it will create error terms that are proportional to the radius of the of the spheres. So this is how you get these these types of terms. Okay, so now uh, with this proposition, I want to show you that we've already obtained some interesting information. So we have a way of re-expressing the, this total uh, pairwise Coulomb energy of the system that's composed of the neutral system that's composed of positive charges and a negative background. We have a way of re-expressing it in terms of these integrals, right? And the idea is that these integrals are going to be extensive in space and scale like um, essentially like the volume of the area in which you integrate them. And so as a corollary, we have a, a lower bound for Fn, which is valid for any configuration of points. Uh, take eta. So you take eta equals uh, for every i. Okay, you, you want to find the, the, the right value of eta i that you should plug in there. Uh, the idea is you want eta i to be small so that these error terms are small. But you also don't want it to be too large, uh, too small, because otherwise these terms will become very negative and you're looking for a lower bound. So if you optimize those two things, you find that the right eta i that you should take is n to the minus 1 over d. And that should not come really as a surprise, because this is the natural um, length scale, which we expect to be the distance between two points, right? The distance between a point and its nearest neighbor, we expect it to be of that order. And so we are truncating here at an order that's comparable to the distance between the points. I could take here any small constant in front. It would not make any difference. Huh? OK, so if I plug that in, what do I get? The idea is I'm going to take Fn of Xn. I have an, a lower bound here. And this term is obviously positive, so I can just discard it. And so I find minus. So I'm going to have n identical terms equal to this. This is the choice of eta i. And the error terms, I bound them below by cn. The eta i squared will give me um, n to the minus 2 over d. And I have n terms, so I have a, a 2. OK. And so now let's compute what this is. So you have to distinguish two cases. In the log cases, um, then g is minus log, right? So what you find here, and I have a, sorry, there is a plus. It's a plus. No, it's a minus. OK, so it's g is minus log, so it's a plus. And then there's a minus. So I get minus n over d log n minus c n to the 2 minus 2 over d. All right. so this, is, uh, this is good. And then in the other cases, oh, because uh, I, I have to assume that the error term has the bad 
the wrong sign, right? I have to assume that it's bad for me. I want a bound from below. I don't know the sign of the error term. So if I want a bound from below, I put it with a negative, uh, a negative constant. This is the worst case scenario. My lower bound is very low. Okay, so in the other cases, g is n to the power, uh, sorry, g is r to the power 2 minus d, if you remember. And so I put that in factor, get n to the minus 1 over d to the power 2 minus d. And if you believe me, it's going to give you minus c n 2 minus 2 over d. Okay, so the logarithmic cases are a little bit different because you get these terms that pop out, which you don't get uh, in the other Coulomb cases. Okay, I think I made a mistake somewhere. No, I guess not. Okay, so for example, in dimension two, you see that this lower bound is of order n, and is, this is actually, the idea is that this lower bound is actually optimal. It gives you the right order. And proving that, of course, is, is a more difficult uh, endeavor. And so once you have a, lower bound for the energy, you can obtain easily an upper bound for the partition function. So now let's think we're in the situation with temperature, and we're looking at the probability density of this form. Now we have a lower bound for Hn, this curly Hn, because we have this splitting formula. And we have a lower bound for Fn. And so naturally, this gives us an upper bound for z, because z, OK, it's the integral of this, the xn. So let's input the lower bound that we just found into the, the integral. OK, so sort of obvious computations, but everything is going to come out of the integral. And you're going to get, say, n squared iv of mu v, if you remember well. Then these terms are going to come out. So I add a plus beta 